Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this event about uh, Georgia. My name is uh, Tom Deval of Carnegie Europe. I'm joining you from London. Um, and we also have uh, three guests uh, sitting in Tbilisi. Uh, our discussion today is about the fascinating topic of Georgia's elusive and unfinished uh, search for European integration. We'll be talking to the coordinator of the CRRC survey uh, on that, Dustin Gilbraith, and to the uh, author of our essay on that topic, uh, Nino Lejava. We'll also be with uh, uh, Archil Gegashidze of the Levan Mikhailese Foundation. Um, this is all part of a project we are basically launching publicly today. Um, we've called it uh, the future of Georgia. Um, it's Carnegie Europe. Uh, um, represented by myself and uh, Ambassador Gegashidze, director of the Levan Mikeladze Foundation. And we're extremely grateful to the um, Foreign Ministry of Sweden and the uh, for their support and the imminent support um, just being finalized um, also of the government of Finland uh, for this project. Now, we all know that Georgia is a politically polarized uh, country. We see this in, in recent, the recent and ongoing domestic crisis. We're looking at something a bit deeper. We're looking at societal divisions, beliefs, contradictions, uh, discussions, issues in Georgia, which are also polarized, but in, in rather different ways. Um, and we're looking in this project at um, some of the most contentious issues in Georgian society. The idea is to discuss those in a sophisticated and civilized fashion, um, to put out issues there, which are often not discussed in Georgian society, and, and to have some structured dialogues in Georgia about that issues with Georgians and also with some European experts. Um, to that end, we commissioned end of last year, a survey from CRRC, um, the best polling organization in the Caucasus. The full version will be available at the end of this month. Uh, we're releasing um, part of the survey results uh, today and Dustin will present those. Uh, Nino's essay is the first of five uh, essays on these interesting and contentious issues. So today we'll be talking about Georgia's European identity. You'll also see in the, in the, in the coming weeks and months essays coming out about Georgia's modern post-Soviet history, about ethnic minorities and language politics, about conflicts, and also about the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church in society. In the summer, um, uh, restrictions are permitting, there will be structured dialogues in Georgia about these interesting and difficult issues. So, um, so Georgia and Europe, just briefly, um, this is obviously a very uh, topical issue on the political sense, given the EU's unfortunately failed attempt to mediate in the current uh, domestic crisis in Georgia. But obviously it goes deeper. Um, Georgia uh, aspires to European integration, but we don't often try and break that down a bit more subtly a bit more deeply about what that means. So first of all, we'll hear from Dustin uh, Gilbraith of CRRC, who will present the findings of our recent survey. Um, then we'll hear from Nino Lejava, um, publisher of Milani, Milani Publishing, the director of Milani Publishing, and for many years known to, to many as the head of the Tbilisi office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And then we'll go briefly to uh, my partner and, and friend, Archil Gagasidze, former Georgian ambassador to the United States, and then and now director of the Levan Mikeladze Foundation. And then we'll have a discussion. Hopefully we, we can fit that all in with one hour and you'll be putting your questions, I hope, uh, in the chat. So first, um, over to you, Dustin. Thank you, Tom, for that great introduction. Um, again, uh, my name is Dustin Gilbreth. I'm the Deputy Research Director at CRC Georgia. And today I'm very happy to be with everyone to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to present some of the findings um, from the Future of Georgia survey, which we conducted in partnership with the Levan Mikeladze Foundation in Carnegie Europe. Um, and could we go to the next slide? Um, so to do that, I'm first going to briefly describe the purpose of the survey. Um, and from there, I'm actually going to spend a fair amount of time talking about the context. Um, in which we were doing the survey and what we knew from data from previous surveys that we had been doing in Georgia. After that, I'll briefly describe the methodology of the Future of Georgia survey and present a few findings that relate to Georgia's European identity that really stood out to me as a pollster in Georgia. 
So could we go to the next slide? Um, so the, the study, it, it had four key themes, um, four key subjects that we really wanted to unravel and address. And these were ethnic identity and tolerance, religious attitudes and the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church in Georgia, and then attitudes towards the West and attitudes towards the recent past. So today I'm just gonna be focusing on a few of the slides that I found striking in attitudes towards the West. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to provide some context for this data. So could we look at the next slide? Um, and so when you think about Georgia and you think about numbers on Georgia, if there's one number that you've probably heard, it's that the vast majority of people support Euro into Atlantic integration. S membership for the European Union and support for membership of the European Union, as well as NATO is sky high in Georgia. So the most recent round of polling that we had a number for was from December 2020 of the NDI survey, which 80% of people said that they supported EU membership and 74% of people said they supported Georgia's membership in NATO. Um, but at the same time, this, this headline number that we often see, um, it, it hides some nuance. Um, and could we go to the next slide? So even though we see this very high level of support in the previous slide, on another survey, the Caucasus Barometer Survey, we've been asking, to what extent would you support Georgia's membership in the European Union? And we asked this on a five-point scale. And with this, we see that there's a great deal of variation um, and there's ups and downs in terms of how much Georgians support um, membership in the European Union. And this really varies quite a bit over time. And that's something that we don't get on the other slide because the other slide presents the NDI data, which asks, do you support Georgia's membership in the European Union? Do you support Georgia's membership in NATO? Yes or no? So my interpretation of this is those people sort of on this slide of Caucasus barometer that are sort of in the middle, they're uncertain. Um, when push comes to shove, they are pro-NATO and pro-EU and Georgia's joining of the EU and NATO. Um, but there is this variation in attitudes that does happen over time. So the next question uh, that really comes to mind and people wonder a lot about is, why do Georgians support Euro-Atlantic integration so much? And so could we go to the next slide? Um, on this, we, we actually asked this on Caucasus Barometer 2019. And we asked what the main reason was that people supported it when it comes to um, the EU and NATO, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but among those that supported NATO, so the 52% that said that they would support Georgia's membership in the European Union, the main reason that people cited was they would improve economic conditions in Georgia. Um, among the 9% who said that they did not support it, the main reason is they didn't see any benefit. Um, so can we go to the next slide? What we see here is the same question asked, but about NATO membership for Georgia, as opposed to EU membership. And what we can see on this slide is that the main reason that people, so the 50% of Georgians in 2019 who said that they would support Georgia's membership in NATO, they would support it because it would improve Georgia's security is the first reason, um, sort of oddly, but if you think about it a bit, it also makes sense about 20% of people, 21% of people said they would improve people's economic conditions as well. When it comes to reasons for not supporting NATO membership, so this was 14% of people who said that they didn't support Georgia's membership in NATO. The main thing that we saw is that, again, Georgia wouldn't benefit from it, um, it was the main response that we got. But the next most common reasons that we saw were something to do with territorial integrity, relations with Russia being hampered. So can we go to the next slide? Um, so in this context, this is sort of what we knew before doing the Future of Georgia survey, among other results. Um, but this was sort of some of the key findings that we had in mind when thinking about the survey as related to attitudes towards Europe. Um, so before I get into the actual findings of the Future of Georgia survey that stood out to me, um, just to briefly describe the methodology, um, it's a nationally representative survey of the adult population of Georgia. Aside from this, though, it's also representative of Tbilisi, other urban areas, and rural settlements separately. We had about 1,900 respondents in the survey, with an average margin of error of 2.2%, and a response rate of 
The survey was conducted in Georgian, Armenian, and Azerbaijani languages. And it was conducted actually face-to-face -face, um, using tablet computers in September of 2020. Um, this last point is particularly important to keep in mind when interpreting the results from the survey because so much has changed um, and the most recent political crisis didn't really start until October, November of 2020. And so this sort of reflects a pre-crisis sort of um, perception set. So could we go to the next slide? So some of the findings that really stood out to me inside of this survey, um, we, we asked people, um, how much do you agree or disagree with the following statements about the potential outcomes of Georgia's further integration into the European Union? And on the slides above, we saw that the main reason that people said is people's economic conditions would improve. But as you can see on this slide, there's a whole, whole bunch of statements that people really agree quite strongly with about improvement of Georgia's conditions with further integration into the European Union. So the first reason is it's easier to go to Europe for education as well as to work, a bit of an economic reason there. Um, but next we see um, attitudes towards, um, we would become more European. Um, so issues about identity, um, we see better human rights protection. So a values and sort of protections type thing. Improvement of democracy is agreed upon. And so the hypothesis that only thing that matters for Georgians about EU integration and NATO integration is that the economy improves, just it doesn't hold. It, it may be the most important when push comes to shove, but it's not the only reason why Georgians really have a strong and high level of approval of Georgia's integration with your Atlantic structures. So when we break this data down um, by social and demographic groups, as you can see on the right-hand graph of this slide, um, what, what we have there is variation um, from a regression. So controlling for other factors, how many of these statements is someone in this particular group likely to agree with? What we can see is that older people are a lot less likely to agree with all of these statements about the benefits of integration. IDPs are more likely to agree with these statements. Um, richer people, they're people who are better off economically are more likely to agree with these statements. And Georgians are, by far much more likely to agree with more of these statements than ethnic minorities. Um, and so that sort of points in sort of the direction of who in Georgian society sees the benefits of further integration with the West. So could we go to the next slide? Um, so although one point that I think that's really important to keep in mind, um, particularly thinking about the fluctuations that we saw above, is that while Georgians very strongly um, support NATO and EU membership for the country and further integration with the West, there really are some strong points um, in which people aren't willing to give up um, certain things for it. So they're not willing to make a trade-off for further integration on some rather extreme points. And so to get at this in the survey, we asked if you had to choose between regaining control over Abkhazia and South Ossetia or membership in NATO and the EU, which would you choose? And what we see is that the vast majority of people would choose um, regaining territorial integrity. Um, only 15% of people nationally, um, or yeah, 15% of people nationally said that they would do this. And this attitude didn't really vary by social and demographic characteristics much at all. The only statistically significant difference that we found between different groups was that people in Tbilisi were significantly more likely to sort of say that, yes, I would prefer NATO and the EU to territorial integrity. So could we go to the last slide? Um, so just to summarize, I mean, some of the key points that I hope you take away from this is that support for Georgia's integration into the West is consistently high, but the intensity of support really fluctuates a great deal as we saw with the comparison of the Caucasus barometer and NDI data. Second, the main reason is the economy. It's the economy stupid thing does hold, um, but it's not just that. We, we have lots of reasons um, why Georgians really do support further integration with Euro, Euro, Euro <laughs> Atlantic institutions. And finally, um, support for Western integration is not absolute. Um, this isn't something that's a fixed pattern and unchanging. Um, and there really are policy issues which we don't expect to see um, change right now 
um, and potentially for many, many years in the future. So um, with that, I will hand the floor back over to um, Tom and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dustin, for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation. I think we were all struck by the slide, the last slide in particular, although they were all interesting about um, if Georgians were given a choice between a recovering Abkhazia and South Ossetia and EU and NATO membership. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we will be going back to you, but now I hand the floor to Nino Lujava, who's written this uh, fascinating essay for us about Georgia, uh, Georgia and Europe. Over to you, Nino. Glad to see you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Um, and thank you very much for this uh, very timely initiative, which is, um, I think, perfect to reflect about the future of Georgia, a country um, on the verge, as another distinguished think tank uh, uh, from Georgia named it. And I was very humbled to get uh, to get this opportunity uh, in uh, to reflect about the future um, of Georgia and about Georgia's uh, European path uh, in this very uncertain, I would say even um, uncanny times globally, and while Georgia is mired in a deep uh, political crisis following disputes over the parliamentary um, elections here. Um, as you mentioned, um, uh, my paper uh, partly is focused also on the three-decade effort that Georgians uh, have made towards, uh, towards uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, and as it uh, reflects also about some um, unfortunate parallels uh, from the century ago, um, while the first democratic republic uh, was founded by Georgia's founding uh, fathers and mothers um, as well. And I've, of course, I will not start to present now um, the whole paper, but I would like to, um, I just wanted to um, present some uh, main findings um, uh, during my uh, interpretations of the uh, results of the survey, which were also um, very helpful for me to um, to reflect about uh, the future of Georgia and uh, also European um, developments um, of the society. So um, I have. Um, three main findings, um, uh, which I already formulated in my essay. And the first uh, and foremost, uh, the good news is, uh, as Dustin already uh, also me mentioned, that most Georgians enthusiastically uh, think of being Europeans as a positive attribute. And according to the survey, um, even 78% of them say that they believe that joining the European Union is a good idea because Georgians will become more European. Yet uh, this statement undoubtedly means different things to different people. So uh, during last years, the majority of the population still supported Georgia's aspiration uh, for the EU membership in spite of the uh, domestic turbulences and in spite of the uh, Eurozone and the migration crises uh, that have occupied the European uh, Union over the years. Um, another finding is that uh, Georgia's views of fostering closer li links to Europe are not uh, anonymous. There are signs uh, of deeper ambivalence um, about the West in some pockets of Georgian society. And the uh, survey results showed us how the elite uh, disseminated message of the benefits of a Western trajectory and development has resonated much more strongly with some groups more than others. Um, and un uh, of course, it is unsurprising that the most positive attitudes toward the West are found among urban respondents whose educational background and 
and or economic standing have exposed them to the benefits offered by the West or allow them to travel to Western countries. Um, less advantaged groups are more ambivalent about Europe and it's also not unsi uh, unsurprisingly uh, for us because representatives of Georgia's ethnic minorities and internally displayed persons as well those who are poorer and older tend to be more skeptical about it. In my opinion, um, uh, the spread of uh, res uh, responses reflects also Georgia's history over the past 30 years and perceived societal divisions uh, between um, winners and losers of the country's pursuit of Western integration. Um, we can also talk uh, later um, about uh, this topic, but um, last but not least, what I also wanted to mention is that if um, Georgians are uh, given a political uh, choice, uh, they strongly uh, prioritize the issue of recovering the lost territories ever, uh, over Euro-Atlantic integration. And... Um, asked to choose between European integration and territorial integrity, more than three quarters of respondents favored reclaiming the lost territories. And it's important that here uh, we have no significant differences between urban and rural population on this point, uh, because in uh, at other questions and uh, answers to other questions, uh, this spread is uh, um, quite always uh, quite heterogeneous. And uh, these findings appear to uh, contradict um, an assumption. Uh, widely held by both uh, Georgian political elites as well civil society groups and um, academians, uh, namely that if Georgia draws closer to Europe, um, that will help peacefully resolve these conflicts and convince the societies of the breakaway territories to switch uh, their gaze from north, from Russia, toward the west. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, these findings and these uh, topics I wanted to present at the, this stage to you, and uh, I expect that we can go deeper uh, later during our discussion um, next minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nino. Um, I'll turn the floor over to Archil, who I think will kick off the discussion, but also um, those, I think most of us here know or should know uh, Archil Gegashidze, who has had, had a long and distinguished career in Georgian foreign policy and analysis, uh, most notably as Georgia's ambassador to the United States, currently director of the Van Mikladze Foundation and our partner in this project. So um, a few words from you, Archil, and, and I um, invite you also to kick off the discussion about our, our theme today. Thank you, Tom, for a kind introduction. Um, in a few words, I'd like to say about the organization I represent. Uh, the Levan Mikladze Foundation is an independent civil society think tank established as a non-profit uh, and non-partisan membership organization based in Tbilisi. And the foundation is named in honor of the famous Georgian diplomat and public figure Levan Mikladze, who in different years served as an ambassador of Georgia to the United States. Austria and the OEC, as well as to Switzerland and the international organizations located there. And many of the invited participants of this event, both in the United States and Europe, knew him well, and some of them even served as board members of the foundation. I'm very glad to that. The foundation undertakes both policy research and advocacy, provides lecturing and capacity building training, and initiates academic and policy discussions. The main mission of the foundation is to support good governance and effective decision making by providing ideas for and policy solutions to the challenges and opportunities facing Georgia at the local, national and global level. And uh, this project we are discussing this event comes at the very right time uh, and it perfectly matches our mission statement. And as Tom said, uh, the project is a partnership between Carnegie Europe and the Vermeer Foundation. And here I would also like to note our fruitful cooperation with the CRRC. The foundation will lead the Georgia-based activities and already has and will 
contribute to all deliverables, including the questionnaires for the CRRC survey, as well as production of five analytical papers and the final expert study on the future of Georgia due this autumn. Uh, as well as, of course, ensuring the translation of all written documents uh, of the project to ensure wide access by the uh, Georgian society. I will stop here uh, talking about my, my organization and uh, just to save time, I will just uh, <clears throat> provoke a discussion uh, and uh, would like to <clears throat> ask a question uh, to Nino. First of all, congratulations uh, on the excellent article. It contains uh, a lot of interesting things uh, for the reader. And my question is uh, uh, about the following. You rightly write that uh, in case of Georgia, conditionality has often worked. In most times, it worked. Uh, this was the case when Georgia entered the Council of Europe back in 1999, and uh, as a precondition carried out significant reforms then. This was the case when Georgia joined the DCFTA or was signing the uh, association agreement, uh, or um, uh, Georgia was about to uh, receive uh, the right uh, uh, of uh, visa-free travel to Schengen area. Uh, yet uh, the fact that European elites have refrained from offering Georgia the chief prize it craves, as you correctly write in your paper, namely EU membership, this has weakened Europe, European le leverage uh, in Georgia and has slowed the pace of political change in Georgia. And now I would like to ask you a question, uh, mostly to a political expert rather than uh, to the, uh, of the author of the paper. My question is the following. Now, as the European Union, at the highest possible level, at the level of its president, is so far unsuccessfully trying to put pressure on the ruling party and the opposition so that together they can find a way out of the political crisis, should we assume uh, that if Georgia already had a membership ticket and was uh, in the process of accession talks, the Georgian stakeholders, both in the government and opposition, would be more susceptible to pressure from Brussels and the crisis we are witnessing these days would have been resolved. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, talking about something that has not uh, taken place is a <laughs> Um, is a uh, thankless task, <laughs> I guess. But um, on the one hand, uh, knowing how complex and extensive the preparations were for the countries in the central and eastern part of Europe during the years um, um, to join the EU, and also um, knowing what immense problems are currently arising in the younger member states as well, it's not easy to claim that the Georgian state was well prepared at any stages um, of the development in the last decades. But um, uh, nevertheless, I also wrote that it was and um, it is also the responsibility of the Georgian elites, political elites, uh, the ruling party. Uh, to make sober promises to their own people and not to regard uh, re rapprochement um, and integration with Europe as a mere uh, checklist. And yet, even though uh, this motivational in um, um, so-called uh, sticks and carrots and mostly carrots have played an important role, uh, European stakeholders have often the, often indoor superficial actions, um, also without observing a deeper commitment to change. And Georgians, the government um, and uh, other political actors had also uh, often closed eyes um, about uh, this um, development. So um, I think, uh, again, it is uh, something what is not more predictable or is not predictable, can't be uh, predicted or interpreted in such a um, current situation when Georgia is still stuck in uh, this uh, uh, crisis. But of course, it, um, uh, it uh, can get very dangerous if Europe will feel the 
moving towards uh, Georgia and also the whole Eastern Partnership region. Uh, Eastern Partnership um, was uh, uh, not uh, um, not high on the political agenda. Let's say it um, on this way, and you had always. Um, many important other issues also to tackle, especially now at this stage, now with pandemic, with green deal, and etc. But again, um, it can, can get very dangerous uh, if um, Georgia will uh, and Georgia society will lose um, uh, this um, per perspective of joining a prosperous uh, uh, area um, for the future. Thank you, Nino. Um, please, um, we've got some questions already, but please keep them coming in the chat. Um, there's a number of questions about Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which I'll group together. But uh, Dustin, uh, what technical question for you, which was why was the surveys uh, response rate so low. If you think it was low, maybe maybe you don't. Yeah, so I, I often get that question, and I, I don't think that it's actually low. So I, I try to think about this in context. So um, political polling in the United States, for instance, has a 1% to 2% response rate. So we're doing about 15 to 20 times better than the United States on most of our surveys. Um, this one was slightly lower than many of our surveys. We usually get around 35 to 40%. But since it was a face-to-face -face survey, um, albeit during a very low point or a low point in the case counts in Georgia, um, it was also done in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so slightly lower than we would normally hope for. But in the grand scheme of things, I would say that the response rate is pretty good. Thanks, Dustin. Well, I'm going to put out some questions and um, feel free, uh, all three of you, to, to, to give me your, uh, give us your answers. Um, so there's uh, some questions coming in about the interesting slide and survey finding about uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia and, um, and territorial integrity. One question, do you think that the preference for territorial integrity over EU-NATO integration is seen as a first step? Uh, someone else is asking, would Georgians accept temporary exclusion of Abkhazia and Ossetia from NATO protection, Article 5, in order to gain accession to NATO? Uh, maybe we shouldn't get too deeply into that, but but, but please do comment briefly. Um, and the question here, what practical ways of assessing the preferences of South Ossetian and Abkhazian population of EU and NATO integration can be implemented? Who who would want to, which of you would want to comment on those that bundle of issues? Uh, <clears throat> let me. Uh, shall I shall I answer to all three please, questions? Please, yeah. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Just which, whichever one you like. Yeah. Uh, this is a very interesting question, uh, and of course, uh, both of both, both of these uh, uh, aspects of policy is a top top five in Georgia. It has always been. Uh, and it, uh, the uh, slide uh, which uh, uh, which uh, Dustin showed us uh, um, of the survey, saying that overwhelming majority of Georgians would prefer territorial integrity over reclaiming territorial integrity over Georgian integration, is very much uh, and very much uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, but uh, the uh, uh, debates in, in the society on which of these uh, priorities uh, should uh, uh, should uh, prevail over another uh, has not taken place yet in Georgia. Well, of course, if asked, uh, and every Georgian can uh, can answer to this question. But uh, there's very little discussion, if any, uh, in in the public uh, how to. Uh, how to um, match or harmonize these two priorities so that neither of them damages the another one. Uh, so uh, there needs to be a further and deeper discussion in the society uh, to uh, uh, get a clearer understanding and position uh, of the body public on how to proceed further with both of these very important priorities. Uh, then the, the question was about uh, 
um, assessing uh, practical ways of assessing the preferences of South Syrian across the population, the integration can be implemented. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, be very clear uh, answering to this question, uh, given the uh, given the propaganda, uh, the anti-Western propaganda, which uh, takes uh, place uh, in the breakaway regions. Uh, anti-Western propaganda, also, by the way, uh, in, in, in Georgia, it's very hard to uh, to uh, to kind of uh, uh, to to make or to make able uh, South Syrians and Abkhaz population to see all the benefits uh, of uh, uh, of being part of the uh, Euclidean uh, community mm, and. Uh, mm, uh, I think uh, a wider policy, a wider approach is needed uh, to uh, get the right message uh, to these populations uh, on the, the Western orientation of Georgia and, and uh, the roots uh, of this choice uh, and the hindrances to, the, uh, to this choice uh, and uh, the implications uh, of uh, you know, if this choice uh, is, uh, is get uh, implemented. Uh, I, I don't see. Uh, I can. Can you remind the uh, the third question? Let, let's um. Thank you, Archil. Let let me let's let's see. Um. I think that's great. But let's hear Nino if you have a your your thoughts on on these issues. Yeah. Thank you. Um. I think we have also to go beyond the uh, questions which were formulated uh, for the survey because uh, while discussing about the preferences. Of the population, we have somehow also to uh, to analyze the uh, these concepts which have been until now discussed uh, in Georgia uh, towards the breakaway territories, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, still um, until today, the public uh, discourse is very narrow about this. The politicians uh, are not daring to um, to offer to the population some new ideas uh, and new approaches about this protracted situation, which uh, um, oppress, all, of course, uh, not only Georgians, but uh, people also on the other side um, of the uh, of the lines, um, which are now um, also very visible um, uh, in this country and where people are dying also um, along. Um, we are missing somehow also uh, deep discussions about these concepts, what it does mean uh, for Georgia uh, for example, uh, to choose between territorial gain or not. And also we are missing a dialogue, uh, dialogue and ex just exchange, even not di uh, even not this level of dialogue, but even exchange of information um, with uh, uh, actors uh, from the other side of um, the societies in Asia and uh, former South Ossetia. And that's why it is a type of protected uh, um, situation when everybody is afraid of kicking off, uh, uh, to kick off uh, the uh, this discussion because they have to lose, um, yeah, their authority, um, their reputation, and so on. But uh, on the other side, I, I observe um, uh, also um, a new uh, rising of new generation of um, internally displaced pe uh, people also who dare and who have also their own authority to uh, speak up about uh, these issues and also to share with us uh, their visions about uh, the future um, of this country and how they perceive to live um, in Georgia. Uh, and I think we have uh, definitely to give uh, platforms to, to these people also from 
both sides. I have no illusions that only uh, dialogue and only talks can uh, can uh, make this very protected situation easier. But I think we need um, definitely to listen to new uh, voices who dare, um, yeah, some visions also. Thank you, Nina. I, I'd like to put a question to you. I mean, in, in your essay, you talk about how some Georgians conceive of Europe in the, in the, in the sense of Europe, Georgia being an ancient European civilization. Um, and we've also had in, in the survey, I don't have the figures quite to hand, but very strongly negative responses to the question, would you like to see more ethnic minorities uh, represented in parliament and also and maybe this isn't such a big surprise, extremely negative um, to the to the question, would you like to see uh, more LGBTQ representation in Parliament? So there seems to be a, a little bit of, a, of a, a mismatch here about what does it mean to be uh, a modern European that in, in sitting in Europe, um, I include Britain at this point, there's a, a, a kind of embrace of, of fairly progressive values when it comes to to all sorts of minorities that seem to be European, but from the same Georgians who are saying that they, you know, regard themselves as European, are also um, being quite hostile uh, on those issues. What, what what do you have to say about that? Hmm. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I think um, uh, this uh, picture. Um, so the uh, the answer on. Um, on these questions um, uh, also reflect uh, the uh, the missed opportunities of uh, state projects on uh, on include inclusion of uh, different minorities and we know that uh, there were several attempts uh, also from uh, former uh, government uh, of Saakashvili to make uh, the possibility for, for example, for ethnic for ethnic minorities uh, to somehow to step in into the Georgian society. But um, mostly a lot of uh, educational programs, and it is also uh, self critics also of somebody who has been involved in uh, in projects of political education. Uh, also um, have failed um, on different matters. Um, and uh, I think it is uh, very important to uh, reflect about, uh, yes, this, uh, th these possibilities, how uh, people perceive also certain developments of modernization um, in this country and uh, from whom they get the information about this and how really it uh, it uh, it can be um uh, how really it can be um uh, lived uh, in this country because uh, speak uh, you mentioned that you are uh, sitting now in the north of europe but uh, and uh, speaking about uh, european values um, it's um, it's it's not a, a very easy issue because uh, there are lots of discussion what uh, now going on also in central europe and also in south of europe what what is um, to be a uh, european um, and uh, that's why um, i think uh, we uh, we have to uh, to uh, analyze the uh, the concrete steps which have been um, uh, done by different governments of this uh, country and uh, and bring it um, also together because values are yeah a very uh, uh, airy um, issue and uh, um, to, when political elites are speaking about uh, about this in english and when they are speaking about this in georgian they are also quite uh, different things what they mean and think about this Right. So, do, do you think this needs something which needs to change at the elite level, or is this an issue in the media? Where, 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 where does this conversation need to happen? Think, so, when you need, uh, uh, when you desire a change, uh, you have to undertake uh, these changes and transitions on all levels. Uh, and uh, again, I think that uh, 
it is not only information and it's not all, uh, only uh, media where um, also the Western partners and donors have been investing uh, quite uh, huge resources, but it's uh, it's also about education. And when I mean education, it means from very beginning also, where uh, concrete ideas and attitudes are also shaping uh, young people. I'll tell them, Dustin, is this, um, would you like to comment on, on this issue? Um, I mean, I, I don't have anything specific in mind, but I mean, the LGBTQ issue, I think really is sort of the, the big one. Um, something that we've seen in the survey data over time is that more and more people are saying that Europe is a threat to Georgia's traditions. Um, but then in qualitative data, when we ask people what those traditions are, um, people generally say, well, we don't like the LGBTQ issues. Um, and so I, I think that that sort of level of tolerance is really a hard one um, right now and for the long term. But I mean, America 30 years ago, most people were against gay marriage as well. And so what the future holds, no one knows, I think, here. I you have a, a comment. No, 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 uh -huh. No specific comments, of course, it's a matter of timing and um, Georgia is evolving, it's developing and uh, maturing. And I think that's the uh, uh, right timing of uh, embracing uh, these new contentious uh, values from Europe uh, is still uh, ahead. And uh, Georgia is moving to that uh, painfully, uh, but uh, still uh, doing that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, at some point, uh, I, I think it's my personal uh, view that an expectation and um, then uh, the, this issue uh, now so much uh, debatable uh, in Georgia uh, will prevail uh, over the sentiments on, of the Georgian population. Thank you. We're actually out of questions. I, I'm told that we had at one point 180 people uh, registered mm -hmm. maybe there. Um, so please don't be shy. Um, I think if you ask a question now, you're almost certainly going to get an answer. But um, I'm happy. I think it's I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the current situation um, and two issues, I guess, which are very current when it comes to the EU and Europe. One is um, whether there's a, a, a disappointment uh, with the EU about the failure to provide um, vaccines to Georgia. We know that 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 um, the Chinese are, uh, are currently moving in at the moment that 200,000 Chinese vaccines are arriving in Georgia. That's one issue um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on. Um, the second one is what, um, the fact that Mr. Danielson, the EU mediator, failed, um, came up with a, a kind of peace plan between government and opposition, um, but it was not accepted to resolve the domestic crisis. Does that tell us anything about the EU or is that purely tell us something about Georgian um, domestic politics. Which, which of you would like to pick up uh, any of those issues? About the uh, vaccines, uh, maybe Dustin is uh, in a better position uh, if uh, we see if CRC has uh, ever kind of, uh, undertook uh, all this kind right. of... Can you speak, uh, speak a bit more loudly, uh, Archil? You're, you're uh, not so clear. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, in terms of uh, the attitude of Georgians uh, towards Europeans regarding uh, the vaccines, availability of vaccines, uh, uh, I, I, I said that maybe maybe Dustin would be able to be more precise in his answers uh, about the attitudes of Georgians. Uh, but my personal uh, my personal understanding is that uh, the the uh, the, uh, the overwhelming uh, the, the most of the complaints uh, go to the Georgian government rather than uh, Europeans who do not want to share some of uh, their uh, vaccines to Georgians. Although, if if going deeper, then of course the question arises that if we are strategic partners and if we value each other and if we can uh, fight shoulder to shoulder in different places together. Uh, then uh, uh, the vaccines is also uh, something uh, of uh, uh, existential uh, for Georgia and uh, why Georgia? 
being so close to Europe, uh, to the West, uh, uh, met, uh, mattering so much uh, for, for the West, uh, especially in this uh, part of the world, why Georgia should not be uh, uh, assisted or helped uh, in any ways uh, to get uh, more vaccines uh, here? Because uh, as we uh, understand, as we see uh, in the media, uh, government uh, and the uh, specialized agencies, they, they, they are doing, uh, to my understanding, their best to, to get uh, as, as many vaccines as possible. But there's a big competition in the world. And the World, world Health Organization has made several times uh, uh, the uh, statement that uh, there is something unjust uh, and un, un, unfair is going on in the world, that uh, the rich countries, they are not willing to uh, share the vaccines uh, to, to the poorer countries, and Georgia is among the latter. Uh, so, but uh, I don't think that uh, a general public uh, has been uh, has been that much uh, uh, concerned uh, uh, on this. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe in, in down the down the road, uh, in, in due course, uh, when everything will be settled and when we will be we back, uh, who acted how and uh, who helped whom, uh, then uh, the, the, some of these questions will be asked in the future. As for uh, Mr. Danielson's mediation, uh, your question was uh, why uh, this mediation is not uh, bringing tangible results so far, right, Tom? Well, the question is, um, does this does this signal that the EU is losing influence in Georgia, or is this just a purely yeah. um, a short-term uh, uh, development? Uh, good, good question. By the way, I, I tried to ask Sanino when I posed uh, her question uh, that uh, if uh, if Georgia uh, would uh, have uh, this membership uh, perspective. Uh, then you should have, uh, of course, a stronger clout in Georgia. Uh, and uh, would then uh, the Georgian stakeholders uh, be more susceptible to this advice or pressure on the part of the Europeans? Uh, my personal, uh, I, I, if, I, if I was asked, then I would answer that yes, uh, the Georgians would value more uh, the uh, mediation offered provided generously by the European Union. Uh, uh, well, this is an answer that uh, EU needs stronger clout, stronger uh, standing and reputation here in Georgia. Uh, and uh, one of the best ways uh, and uh, sh sort of way to do that is to offer membership, even very distant uh, uh, membership uh, to Georgia. That would dramatically increase uh, EU's visibility and standing in the country. Um, if I may also add uh, some words uh, uh, to this second question, Tom, if, you, uh, if I may. So I think uh, from this um, attempt of first uh, facilitation and then mediation, um, uh, we learned uh, certain lessons that, of course, it's about Georgia and it's about uh, Europe or European Union. And it's about the political cultures. Um, 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 of the actors. And um, we're speaking about this, that this protracted crisis long uh, since the um, last election. But um, we should remember also that the population was looking forward since at least 2019 uh, to these elections also as an instrument of um, uh, also uh, as an instrument of uh, um, of getting out of uh, the, the certain deadlock where the Georgian politics has already um, um, been uh, since last years and uh, um, dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of uh, surveys, researches, policy papers. Uh, um, other articles have been produced about um, about the rising political uh, polarization in this country, and unfortunately, the uh, the political actors uh, are are very reluctant to 
this evidence-based and scientific, uh, mostly scientific um, results, which all of us are presenting to them. Um, and this polarization is now, I, I, I don't know if even if it is at the highest level, uh, this, uh, this could get even much worse from my uh, perspective and it could bring this country and the society uh, during the whole global uh, crisis also into a bigger uh, societal and economic crisis. Um, and I think this is, these are this, um, also these um, expectations of Georgian politi uh, politicians uh, to each other. Uh, Georgian political culture is very masculine and uh, consent and consensus is something which is uh, some is uh, interpreted as losing and being a loser it's even in georgian something very wrong from them and unfortunately uh, georgian political actors as well as the ruling party developed from uh, for themselves these red lines which they don't want to um um yeah somehow to either cross or step back and uh, and i think that uh, or that the europeans were not expecting uh such rig rigid um, attempt of georgians to um their own country and to the future of this country also right thank you that's quite a bleak perspective but thank you um Dustin, anything to add from, from your side? I mean, just sort of building on what Nino was saying, um, the whole pol polarization phenomenon in Georgia really is a quite elite process um, and an elite phenomenon. So Koba Termanidze and I, we tried, um, and we looked through, I think, 30 different data sets trying to find um, profile, who's GD's base and who's the UNM's base. Um, and we. I think we found three differences in terms of policy preferences um, from looking at all of these surveys. And even those differences, while statistically significant, are really just quite small. Um, and the public, it's, it's not really divided by party. Um, it's not politically polarized, but the elite, it really is. And I don't think there's any way of denying that from what we see on a daily basis. Um, so that's something that I always think it's really important to remember when discussing polarization. That's actually a fascinating insight, which I think we're going to have. We're drawing to a close, but but just to reiterate that you know Georgia obviously does have this very personality-based politics, um, and yet society moves in its own direction, has its own currents and forces, which is very much what um, the project um, that we're that we're launching is looking at. It is is what society thinks, what society wants, and 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 what can dialogue. Uh, can there be within society for, to, to help Georgia move forward? Um, I think we are basically uh, out of time. Um, we only have, uh, I think, about a minute left. So I'd like to very much thank um, our three panelists, uh, um, Dustin Gilbraith from CRRC, Nino Lajava, and um, Archil Gegashidzi of the Levan Mikulazi Foundation. I'd like to thank you. Um, all of you for, for tuning in and I hope you found it interesting. Um, Nino's essay, as I said, is, is the first of five. So please watch this space um, for more, um, more interesting essays coming out. Um, and also please do look at Nino's essay and also the CRSC survey data, which is available um, today. Um, you, can, you can find that in the essay and on the CRSC website. The Georgian version of, of um, if, if, if you prefer to read in Georgian, of Nino's essay is out. Uh, is that out, chill? And is that out in the next couple of days? I guess is that right? Um, and um, and um, plenty more uh, to come, including the full uh, survey data of, every, of all everything we've covered will be available uh, at the end of this month. Um, so that's it uh, from me, uh, and thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you again all soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you.